Well, if you could turn back in your Bibles to the passage that Sai just read for us, Lamentations chapter 3. If you have a church Bible, that's on page 688. Um, if you're here in the building and you don't have a Bible, raise your hand and one will work its way to you. Um, Lamentations chapter 3, page 688. Um, now, I am aware that this is not exactly the most Christmassy passage we could be looking at this evening. That did cross my mind. Um, this isn't really intended to be a, a Christmas sermon, though. Um, like Sai said, this is the last Sunday of the year. Um, so think of this more as a sermon for the end of the year, um, specifically the end of this year. Because um, over the next few days, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of talk both in our conversations, but especially in the media, in the news about the kind of year that we've had. And people will bring out all the big news stories of the year, whether that's Brexit, again, uh, the US election, Black Lives Matter, and then of course, COVID-19. Because um, this has been a year that's been lived in the shadow of the virus, hasn't it? it it's something that's been inescapable, that's affected every part of our lives, it seems. Um, some of us have suffered from it firsthand, um, or have had loved ones suffer with it. Others have suffered financially, or in terms of uh, our job security. Um, but even if we haven't been affected in those ways, all of us, I think, have had our freedoms limited and our, our lives changed by the, the restrictions that have been put in place. We've been kept from seeing people that we love. We've been kept from doing things that we enjoy, from going places that we want to go. And with these limitations, I think for many of us can come a certain amount of uh, mental, emotional, and even spiritual strain. Um, because it can often be, can't it, that our, that our worldly struggles have an impact on, on our faith and on our, our walk with God. Um, perhaps we've, we feel a bit sort of spiritually starved, maybe, by not being able to come to church. Or, or perhaps we're, we're struggling to, to, to feel God's presence with us like we used to. Perhaps we're struggling to believe his promises. We're, perhaps we're struggling to believe that he is who we thought he was. Uh, or perhaps we're even doubting whether he's there at all. Now, of course, some people listening tonight might have not experienced any of that. Um, for some of us, 2020 might actually have been a great year of spiritual growth and encouragement. And perhaps you've been able to see, even in this, this, this year, how God has been using certain difficulties in your life to grow and, and to shape you. And if that is you this evening, then that is wonderful. And, and praise God, that is something to be, to be thankful for. Uh, these verses in Lamentations, this, this sermon this evening, it is meant to be a sort of uh, consolation sermon for the end of a difficult year, if I can put it that way. Um, but if you haven't had a difficult year, please don't feel that you can switch off and that this isn't for you. Um, because it is pretty much guaranteed that at some point you will experience similar difficulties, even if you haven't this year. And at the very, very least, you will know people who are struggling or, or who will struggle. So at the very, very least, you can be using these verses to encourage them, even if, even if not yourself. Um, so we're in the book of Lamentations, a, a very brief kind of introduction to the book for, for those who don't know it as well. Um, as the name suggests, Lamentations is in many places quite a miserable book. Um, it, it expresses a great amount of grief and fear as well as a certain kind of confusion as to why God would make or allow certain things to happen. Um, traditionally, the book has been thought to be the work of the prophet Jeremiah, which is why in our Bibles it comes straight after the book of Jeremiah. Um, we can't be 100% certain that Jeremiah did write it because he's not actually named as the author anywhere in scripture, but regardless, it does seem very clearly to have been written by someone who was alive when Jeremiah was, and someone who lived through and survived the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians in 587 BC, when, when the Babylonians came and they uh, besieged and conquered and destroyed the city of Jerusalem. And that was a time of terrible suffering and grief for God's people. Um, chapter 3, which we're in this evening, it's written in the first person. So you'll have seen it. It opens with the words, I am the man who has seen affliction. And this man, whether it's, it's Jeremiah or, or some other author, he's, he's retelling his own personal experience of events. Although his experience really does seem to kind of encapsulate and sum up the experiences of, of the whole city. Uh, tonight, we're, we're mainly just going to be focusing in on three verses, uh, verses 22 to 24. 
And these verses are probably the most famous verses in this book of Lamentations, I think it's fair to say. And they're really remarkable for the, the hope and just the, the optimism that they express in the middle of a book which, as I've said, it is fairly miserable, um, mostly. Um, now, before we go any further and start to actually dig into these verses themselves, I just want to issue a few caveats um, a few little disclaimers uh, for this evening's message. Um, the first is that whilst 2020 has been a difficult year for many people, most of us, by God's grace, have not experienced suffering to the degree that the people of the Book of Lamentations did. Um, they had their homes destroyed, they had their loved ones killed or, or led away into exile. By God's grace, most of us have not had to experience anything on that level, and it's good for us to, to acknowledge that up front. Um, but what made the suffering of these people especially painful was the fact that they knew that the destruction of Jerusalem was an act of God's judgment and discipline against them. They'd been warned that it was coming, but they didn't repent, they didn't turn back to God, and so they had to face his wrath. Now, our situation today is less clear-cut than that. Um, there might be an argument to be made uh, that, that perhaps elements of the, the pandemic are, are a form of God's judgment or, or discipline, but I'm not qualified to say whether or not that is the case, and I think it would be unwise for us to draw too close a parallel between what we're going through right now and what the people of Lamentations suffered. So I'm not going to do that tonight. However, even though, by God's grace, our situation is not as extreme as theirs, and even though we might not be as, as conscious, as conscious of, of being under God's wrath, Lamentations still has some really valuable lessons for us. Um, the fact that, that the people in this book could, could suffer to the extent that they did and still produce verses like this is a real testament to God's power to sustain us in the middle of whatever we might face. And, and this writer, he, he went to extremes that, that we may never have to go to. He, he lived through his home and likely his family being destroyed. He lived through starvation and through poverty and the fear that he might die any day. And his faith was challenged and it was shaken to its core. And yet he was able to say, as he says in verses 22 to 24, let's, let's just read them again. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. And those are wonderful words, aren't they? And if this year has been difficult, as it will have been for many of us, these words can encourage us. But we sort of have to allow them to encourage us, if that makes sense. It's very easy to allow ourselves just to be overcome thinking about things we can't do, or things that we've lost, or things that we want but don't have. And there is a, a time uh, and a right way to think about those things, but these particular verses in Lamentations, they, they want us to focus on something else instead. Um, so j just look at verses 19 to 21, which really set us up for the passage we're going to look at this evening. Verse 19 says, remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall, that's bitterness, basically. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. So the writer, he, he remembers his pain and his difficulty, but then he chooses to think about something else instead. He says, but this I call to mind, and so he has hope. Thinking about pain and difficulty isn't wrong, and there is a time to do it, but we also do have to call certain other things to mind if we're to have the hope that's being described here. And, and sometimes we have to really make an active decision to think about these things if they're going to uh, help us. So as, as we go on this evening, it would be really good, I think, to, to frame our thoughts in this way. Um, so that's where the, the title of this evening's sermon comes from. But this I call to mind. Because there are lots of things that we could think about, but for now, at least, we're going to choose to think about these things in particular. Uh, and the three things in particular that I want us to draw out of these, these verses, verses 22 to 24, three things to, to call to mind, three things to think about, to encourage us as we look back on what has perhaps been a difficult year and as we look forward to walking with God through whatever comes next. 
these three, three things are, firstly, God's love that never ends. Secondly, God's mercies that are always new. And thirdly, our inheritance that is guaranteed. I'll say that again, God's love that never ends, God's mercies that are always new, and our inheritance that is guaranteed. Love, mercies, inheritance. So first of all then, the first thing to call to mind, God's love that never ends. As verse 22 says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Um, Now at this point, I just wanna hit pause and and point something out. Um, Anyone who is reading from a different translation of the Bible, perhaps at home, um, you might have a verse 22 that looks a little bit different. Um, So the NIV, for instance, says, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. Um, The New King James Version also has something similar to that. Uh, This isn't a a, a translation difference, it's actually more of a manuscript difference. Um, Without wanting to get bogged down in in too many details, basically there there are different ancient manuscripts that, that Bible translators used to basically put together the the modern version of the Old Testament that we have today. And and for the most part, those manuscripts, they they agree and then complement each other. Um, Occasionally, you get these little kind of discrepancies, and and we have one here. Um, So there's a bit of confusion in the grammar. It's not quite clear what it is that this verse is describing as never ceasing. So on the one hand, it might be that it's God's love that never ceases, Or it could be that we, i.e. God's people, never cease because of God's love. So it comes down to a difference of of grammar, really. Um, Now, both of those things are true, of course. God's love never ceases, and we are sustained by that love. Those are both true. It's just a question of, well, what is this verse saying? Um, Now, for the purposes of this sermon, I'm going to go with uh, what the ESV says, so what we have in our church Bibles, um, mainly because I think that just fits better with the rest of the passage. Um, Although most of what I'm going to say this evening should still work for the other version, um, if if you want to be picky. Um, But this evening, at least, we're going with the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Okay, So the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. That means it never ends. It never wears out. It never runs out. It never gets cold. It never gets bored. It never gets distracted. God's love is endless, and it is rich and deep, and it is strong, and it is loyal and committed and faithful. The Hebrew word here for love is hesed, which is a word that's used throughout much of the Old Testament to talk about God's covenant love for his people Israel. Um, Here it's translated as steadfast love. You might also see it as faithful love or great love or loving kindness. Um, And the main thing about this love, here at least, is that it is committed and it is faithful. Um, It isn't just a feeling, it isn't just a a passing preference that God has, and it doesn't change like human love can. It is totally and perfectly faithful. And so it's not really a surprise then that, that later in verse 23, the writer goes on to say, great is your faithfulness. Because God's love for his people and his faithfulness toward them, they go hand in hand, they go together. They're both totally committed and endless. And notice as well that it's, it's the steadfast love of the Lord that never ceases. So the writer's using God's name here, the Lord in capital letters, or Yahweh in, in the Hebrew. And interestingly, it's only the second time in this chapter that he's done that. And that is interesting because... As you will have seen when Sai was reading it to us earlier, the first part of this chapter is all about God. It's all about the things that God has done um, or or the things that God has made happen. But for the most part, the writer just refers to God as he or him. It's not actually until verse 18 that he uses his name for the first time and calls him the Lord. So in verse 18, he says, my endurance has perished, so has my hope from the Lord. Now that verse is not a very encouraging verse, is it? The the writer's basically saying that he feels like he's lost his hope in God. But he does use God's name, which is interesting. He he calls him the Lord, he calls him Yahweh, and it's almost as if just the use of that name alone is enough to start these thoughts going round his head that then spill out onto the page when we get to verse 22. That There's something about God's name, the Lord, that just brings encouragement. And that is backed up by scripture, by the way. So um, Proverbs 18 verse 10 says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it 
and is safe. So the name of God, the Lord, is powerful and is encouraging. Now, the Lord is God's personal name, if you like. It's the name that God revealed to Moses and to Israel, uh, the name that he, he most often uses to refer to himself in the Old Testament. It's the name that he gives to himself to sort of most clearly sum up who he is. The Hebrew Yahweh is built on the Hebrew for I am. So every time this name, the Lord, is used, every time we read the Lord in capital letters in the Old Testament, it should be a reminder to us of that powerful statement that God makes to Moses in Exodus 3.14 where he says, I am who I am. So when we read then that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases or the steadfast love of Yahweh never ceases, the steadfast love of I am never ceases, we should sort of step back and think, well, of course it doesn't, right? Of course it doesn't. This is the Lord. This is the I am. This is the one who is, who always is, who always has been, always will be. He is the Lord who never ceases. He is the one who is unchangeable and, and eternal and ever constant and never changing. So, of course, his love and his faithfulness are perfectly steadfast because, quite frankly, how could they be anything different? The love of God never ceases because God never ceases and he never changes. And as the Apostle John says, God is love. So not only does he exist eternally, perfectly forever, but he exists in, in a state of perpetual love. God's love is what it is, essentially because he is who he is. And, and that's the main encouragement really to take from this verse tonight, is that God's love for his people is faithful and steadfast and unchanging and never ending because God is faithful, steadfast, unchanging, never ending. And this also means that his love is perfectly dependable. You can rely on it, you can rest in it, you can take refuge in it, you can hide yourself in it, you can trust it, you can trust God's love because you can trust God. God's love is also something of a, a sort of universal constant, if I can put it like that. Before anything in the whole of creation existed, God was love. His love is eternal, and if you are his, if you are following him this evening, then his love for you is eternal, and it is there constantly, regardless of what you feel, regardless of what you are going through, regardless of whether or not you can see that love, it is there. It, it's sort of, almost, this is a bad analogy, but it's a bit like the laws of physics. It's sort of like gravity, right? Gravity exists regardless of whether or not you think it exists. If you go up, you will come down, and there's not really anything you can do about it. In a similar sort of way, if you are trusting in God this evening, then his love for you is real and steadfast and faithful, even if you don't feel it, or even if you can't see it. It is, it is fundamental, if you are his, his love for you is so fundamental that it existed before anything in the universe was brought into being. So the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. So if you are a Christian, before God created the world, he loved you. No matter what you have experienced this year or no matter how, how much you may or, or may not have been aware of God's love for you, it is real and it is steadfast and it is faithful. So call this thing to mind. Remember this, that God's love is steadfast and faithful and never ends. So that's the first thing to remember, God's love that never ends. The second thing to call to mind, the second thing to remember is God's mercies that are always new. Notice in verse 22, the word is mercies with an S, right? It's, it's plural. So the writer isn't thinking so much about God's mercy in general here, but, but more about God's specific acts of mercy towards his people. These mercies are, are the, the repeated manifestations of God's grace and goodness every single day, the, the specific individual good things in our lives that God gives to us each day. And these mercies are new every morning. It's as if the writer of Lamentations could, could woke, uh, wake up every day and see real tangible examples of God's mercies, of God's good gifts to him, both big and small. 
And that's really remarkable when you remember again the situation that these people were in, right? That their homes were destroyed, their families had been taken from them, they were starving, they were in poverty, they were fearing for their lives. And even in the middle of all of that, this writer is able to say, no, there is a mercy from God. There is another one, there is another one, and another one, and another one, every single morning. Um, One commentator puts it really well, he says, Every breath, every sip of water, every crust of bread, every stitch of clothing is regarded by the writer as evidence of the ever new, inexhaustible mercies and compassions of the Lord. What amazing and and remarkable gratitude. There is grieving in Lamentations, of course. The writer does take time and many other points in the book to mourn for everything that he and the people of Jerusalem have have lost. But there is also this astounding thankfulness um, to God for the things that he still gives them, even if those things might seem small compared to what they had before. And I think the description of these things as mercies is particularly helpful, actually, um, because mercy is by definition, it's something that we don't deserve. Um, Other translations uh, call these compassions, and that that works too. Um, Mercy or or compassion, these these are free gifts from God. They're not deserved. We're not entitled to them. We haven't earned them. We're just given them by God out of his grace, out of his love and goodness. And that means as well, of course, that if they are taken away, then, well, they are taken away. Just that. Um, Job is a character in the Old Testament who experienced this when he had a whole host of God's mercies just taken away from him in one go and yet he was able to say the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away blessed be the name of the Lord he blessed God he was thankful to God even when all of these mercies were taken away from him And, and that thankfulness it comes I think when we remember that these are God's mercies So remembering them is not just about looking on the bright side or trying to stay upbeat and optimistic. God's mercies are gifts. And so remembering them is also about remembering who the giver is. So if you you got a present at Christmas, hopefully you weren't just happy to get it. Hopefully you also said thank you to the person who gave it to you. If you didn't, maybe you should. Um, in, in In a similar sort of way, we shouldn't just be happy about the good things that that we have, but we should be thankful to God for them because they come from him. They are his mercies. And we do have so many mercies to be thankful for, don't we? Let's be honest, especially in this, this country at this time, even though there's a pandemic going on, most of us are still just drowning in God's mercies. Now, the specific mercies that, that you have to be thankful for, they might be slightly different depending on the the situation that you're in at the moment. But I think it's safe to say that that most of us, we we still have food, we still have a roof over our heads, most of us. Many of us, we still have friends and families, even if we can't see them like we'd like to. And even if that's not the case, the people of Lamentations lost all of those things and they were still grateful. In fact, Even if you're not a believer this evening, even if you're not a Christian, the Bible makes it very clear that you are still benefiting from God's mercies. Because every good thing that comes to every single person is a mercy from God. So Jesus says in Matthew 5, verse 45, he says, For the Father makes his Son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So, God makes the sun rise on all of us, and he gives us all rain. So in other words, he makes the crops grow so that we can have food. His mercies are new every morning, whether we acknowledge him or not. He continues to sustain creation, continues to sustain us out of his abundant grace and mercy, even when we don't acknowledge him for that. So again, this is something to to call to mind, to remember God's mercies are new and they are fresh every morning, every day. And yes, he might take some specific mercies, some specific good things away from us. But we were never entitled to those things in the first place because they were mercies from God. Even if it does seem that we've lost all of them, 
like the people in Lamentations, there will still be some things to be thankful for. Every day, God is, is making the sun rise. He is sustaining us. He's giving us life. He's giving us good things that we don't deserve simply out of his love and grace. And it is good to call these things to mind, to remember them, and to allow them to make us grateful to God for his abundant goodness. So, things to call to mind, things to remember. We've got God's love that never ceases, God's mercies that are always new and that keep on coming, and then finally, our inheritance that is guaranteed. Um, now, let me just explain where I'm getting this word inheritance from. It, it's not in the church Bibles. Um, an inheritance is something that you, or perhaps your family, um, is entitled to, something that you have a, a right to, something that, that stays with you, and that is something that is guaranteed. So whilst God's individual mercies might come and go, our inheritance from God is something that we are guaranteed. Now in the church Bibles, verse 24 doesn't say inheritance, it says, the Lord is my portion. Now if I say the word portion, what do you think of? At this time of year, probably a plate of food. Um, and that's actually quite a good image. Um, a portion is something uh, that you're given. It's, it's an allotment of something, as if to say, this bit is for you, and, and that's enough. That, that will satisfy you, that will do. Um, in the Bible, the word portion is often used to describe an inheritance, um, often actually an inheritance of, of land. So when the Israelites came into the promised land, all of the various tribes and the groups of, of Israel, they were given their portions or their inheritances, and the land was divided up between them. And the writer of Lamentations, he's using, using quite similar language in verse 24 when he says, the Lord is my portion. He's, he's essentially saying the Lord is my inheritance. The Lord is my lot. He is what I am given. And that is enough. Let all the other people have their land and their homes and their wealth and their physical safety. I will have the Lord. He is my portion. He is my inheritance. And that is all I need. Notice he doesn't say God's mercies are new every morning and they are my portion. It's not the individual good things that God gives us that, that, that the writer is holding on to in verse 24, because he knows that they might be taken away. Instead, it is God himself that he's holding on to, the Lord, Yahweh, the one who is the eternal one, God who is love perfectly and faithfully and steadfastly forever. That is his portion. That's his inheritance, his lot. That's the thing he is guaranteed, is God. That's what he has to hold on to. The smaller mercies that God gives us, if I can call them that, uh, the sun rising or, or food on our tables, they're good things. They're absolutely good things that we ought to be thankful for, as we've said. But they're not our inheritance. They're not the thing that we are guaranteed to get. As Job says, the Lord can give these things and he can take them away. They're not guaranteed to stay with us. But our inheritance, the thing that God guarantees us, our portion is himself, if we are trusting in him, if we are following him. Above all of his smaller mercies, God gives us himself, and he does this, of course, most clearly in Jesus. Through Jesus' death, which takes away our sins, which pays the price for them, through his resurrection, which wins for us eternal life, we are guaranteed an eternal, perfect relationship with God in heaven to enjoy his love, enjoy his mercies, but most importantly, to enjoy him forever. Our inheritance, our portion, is God himself and an eternal, perfect relationship with him. And that relationship begins now. It begins from the moment that we come to know and, and trust in Jesus. But of course, it's, it's marred and it's, it's damaged by sin. It will be fully revealed to us when we get to heaven, where we can enjoy God perfectly forever, free from sin. Now, if you're not a Christian this evening, this inheritance, this portion, it is made available to you to enter into it, to, to claim it, if you like. All you need to do is, is believe in Jesus, repent of your sins, turn and follow him as your Lord. As Jesus says, whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. 
Jesus also says what eternal life is. He says in John 17, eternal life is to know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Eternal life is to know God, to be in eternal relationship with him. And this is available as a guaranteed inheritance to all who would believe and trust in Jesus Christ. Now, if that is you this evening, if you are a Christian, then know that this inheritance is guaranteed by Jesus even when you don't feel it. Uh, much like God's steadfast love is constant and it's there whether or not you're aware of it, this eternal perfect relationship with God that his people are promised in Jesus Christ is guaranteed. And it's, one that, it's an inheritance that you, you have now already, even though you might experience it imperfectly because of sin and trials. But a day is coming when that relationship will be experienced perfectly. Uh, the Apostle Peter puts this really beautifully when he writes this in, in one of his epistles. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. The Lord is our inheritance, is our portion. And in heaven, we will know that far more fully than we ever possibly could on earth. Whilst we are on earth, though, that imperishable, unfading inheritance of perfect, eternal relationship with God should give us hope. Much like it gives hope to the writer of Lamentations. He says in verse 24, he says, The Lord is my portion, therefore I will hope in him. As Christians, our experience of hope can change. We can be more hopeful one day and we can be less hopeful the next day. But our inheritance and the thing that our hope is in is God and that eternal relationship with him. And that does not change. Because again, God does not change. He is the Lord. He is the eternal I am. He is constant. And likewise, his love for us, his steadfast love for us doesn't end. And his mercies keep coming fresh every day. And these things are meant to give us hope. And to, to experience that hope, we need to call these things to mind. We need to remember that God's love is endless, that his mercies come afresh to us every day, and that he is our inheritance that is imperishable and unfading. 2020 has been a, a difficult year for many people, a difficult year for many of us. Um, but COVID-19 or, or whatever other trials you might have faced this year, faced this year as, as genuinely terrible as those things might have been, not one of them, not one of them can end God's love. Not one of them can, can fully stop his abundant mercies. Not one of them can remove the inheritance that belongs to his people, that eternal perfect relationship with him, nothing. If you are a Christian, call these things to mind and remember them and let them encourage you. Reading these three verses from Lamentations to yourself would be one good way of doing that. If you're not a Christian, then in some ways the, the message to you is similar. Call these things to mind, remember them, think about them. Right? So remember that God's mercies come afresh to you every morning, to everyone, including you. Remember that God's love is steadfast and faithful and that that love brought him to the cross to die, to save and to forgive sinners like you. And remember that the inheritance of, of a perfect relationship with God for, for eternity that he gives to those who put their trust in him and repent of their sins and follow him as Lord. Remember those things, think about them and then put your trust in him. Repent, turn to him so that you might share in that wonderful inheritance so that it might be yours, and so that you can say with the writer in verse 24, the Lord is my portion, and therefore I will hope in him. May God bless his word.